So I have Michelle Wallace uh, with me, who is the Executive Director uh, of the Office of Innovation and Development for Austin ISD. And uh, joining us virtually in our, uh, uh, what do we call that? <laughs> our, chair memento, our, our Chair of Honor is uh, Elena Berry, who's joining us from Chandler ISD uh, via, via Zoom. So she, you should see here, here shortly. She's the, the lady to the top there. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, so uh, the way we wanted to start this off, we're gonna take you kind of through a little bit of a journey uh, in terms of how did we get here? We're gonna talk about finances, we're gonna talk about people, platform, and uh, policy, and how all of that kind of came together, uh, and how Austin ISD and Chandler ISD have really wrestled with this issue of crowdfunding in light of the circumstances uh, that K-12 schools find themselves in, which is uh, a lack of funding. So um, with that, um, we should have a slide, which will come next, maybe. Slide, there you go. Uh, so this slide uh, represents uh, the current um, climate of fundraising in, in Texas. So you essentially have uh, Texas being the fourth wealthiest state in the country, uh, yet it lags in school funding as the 36th uh, when it comes to school finance, when it comes to school uh, pupil, pupil expenditure. And so my first question for uh, both Michelle and uh, Lena are, you know, how has fundraising changed over the last 10 years in light of these circumstances? Yeah, um, thank you, Gary. Thanks for having us here today, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I think um, fundraising has, has changed quite a, a great deal, and K-12, what I've seen, has really um, come more and more to embrace uh, that fundraising is happening in schools already um, and is sort of part of our reality. Um, I don't think private philanthropy um, should ever or will ever uh, replace public dollars, um, fill the role that public dollars should in education. But if you look around at other um, models, um, higher ed, private education, um, all of those really incorporate and embrace a culture of philanthropy. And I think K-12 um, is beginning down that road. Um, some districts are further along than others, um, for sure. But, um, but I think it's, it's, it's always been there. I think we've done more um, recently to embrace it, create structures that support it, make it easier for people to give, to support our schools and our kids. And in Austin ISD, we see that some of the initiatives and programs that um, are really putting us on the map in the country, like our social and emotional learning initiative, for example, we would only be where we are with that work. Um, we are only where we are with that work because of a public-private partnership that has supported it, um, kept our district focused on it during times of transition, and it's really a reflection of our community's values um, saying, you know, no, this is important for our district to focus on. And so I think, I think it's always been there. I think we've just started to embrace it more, create structures to support it more, make it easier for our community to give to support our schools in Austin. Um, and if we could have, Lena, I don't know if you can hear us, uh, but... Same, same question to you, How's this, what does this look like in, in Chandler, Arizona? Sure, well, uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you for having me. Um, in Chandler, we have a lot of unique needs. Um, across Arizona in general, we're funded one of the lowest in the nation. And our parents really want to support their schools and so they're very um, outgoing. They want to raise money in either the PTO boosters, they want to raise money at the school level, the student organization, and since we're so large, at 46,000 students, we see a lot of fundraising um, options happening across our district. Um, it's a way for our community to give. It's also a way for us to fund a lot of our capital needs, um, where our schools raise money for computers on wheels or playgrounds or other things that they're raising money for. And we found that we needed a, a crowdfunding platform because they were raising money in the old methods um, and they 
weren't, there's a lot of fraud, other things that he's replaced. And we found that this was the new method to raise the most amount of money with the best safeguards put in place. But we needed to standardize that, approve it. We needed to have a system in place that we could be proud of so that people, when they donated to a Chandler Unified School District fundraiser, they knew exactly where their money was going. Um, and Lena, we have a special request from our uh, audiovisual folks. If you could uh, either mute your computer or your phone, um, I think that would help the audience hear you a little bit better. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, one follow-up question for uh, Michelle, since we are in Texas, um, and I don't know if you guys have been following um, what's going on with Austin ISD and next year's budget. I think I, I read that there's a, um, you know, per the Robin Hood laws, there's 750 million that will be taken from Austin ISD and kind of redistributed around around the state. That's one way to say it, <laughs> yeah. Um, who here is from Texas? Anyone, okay, so lots of Texans in the room. So yeah, I mean, Austin ISD is the largest payer into the recapture system. Um, I think our anticipated payment next year is $700 million. We're a property wealthy district, but we also serve over 50% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. So. Um, the, the formula doesn't work so well for Austin. Um, we're hoping for some relief from the state uh, right now. They're in, in session. Um, but I think what I come back to is, um, you know, what I mentioned earlier, some of our signature programs and things that we're most proud of as a community, I think, have been supported by um, philanthropic giving as well as local tax dollars. Um, and I think that partnership is critical. Um, as our Senator Kirk Watson said at our um, Education Foundation, our Austin Ed Fund event this year, you know, the, the state finance formula does not serve Austin well. And the reality is we would be raising money for our schools anyway, and we should be. So I think that's, I think that's key. I think we can get sort of, um, just really depressed about the school finance system and, and just sort of feeling like we're not, the reality is philanthropy could, could not, should not fill the hole. Um, but what is the role? And, and I, I kind of put that in two buckets, um, innovation and enhancement. I think private philanthropy can really help schools and school districts, um, work in areas of innovation and then areas of enhancement. So for example, um, in my previous role, I worked at the Ann Richard School for Young Women Leaders here in Austin. Um, we had a college advisor for that school and the school's goal is 100% of those girls will go to colleges. Um, the college advisor is a position that's at every single AISD school. So every school has access to that. Um, what we wanted is for our students, our girls, to go on a college visit every year, um, minimum one or two colleges a year from the time they were in sixth grade to the time they graduated when they were seniors. So um, the foundation at that school raised private dollars to send those girls on those college visits. So that would be an area of enhancement where um, our local tax dollars, public tax dollars um, go so far and then private philanthropy can come in and really achieve the vision that we have for our students. Awesome, and you know, just to, to emphasize that, I think the, the new formula in K-12 is you have federal dollars, you have state dollars, you have local dollars, uh, but you have a growing portion of that coming through philanthropy. I don't think it'll ever be enough, uh, but it is part of the equation now, whereas maybe it wasn't, wasn't before. Um, so the, the next thing I wanna talk about a little bit, uh, and this is kind of where my journey in this whole discussion starts, uh, um, I know we're in Texas, so I have nothing against burritos or tacos in general. <laughs> um, but to, to answer this question, how many burritos does it take to fund a school? Uh, it's a whole lot of burritos uh, to, to do that. And so um, my journey through, through all of this and my question to the group is, you know, how has the role of parents changed in all of this? Um, and maybe I'll, I'll start with my story, but as, as I'm going through that, that will be, that will be the question. So. Um, how I got started in this uh, K-12 journey of fundraising is my own daughter was doing a fundraiser. Do we have, do we have any parents in the room? Okay, so you might relate to this story. 
um, she was running around a track. We were, I was collecting uh, quarters and cash and really begging people to help support her uh, because they wanted to put a new track in at the school. And I thought that was a great idea. So uh, this was back in 2013. And uh, I'm going around uh, collecting all of this and thinking to myself, what did I do wrong <laughs> that I'm out here <laughs> begging for a dollar so my daughter can run around the track? But being a, a good dad, I wanted to be supportive, so I did it. Um, and so collectively, I thought we had raised uh, $30,000 um, to put in this new track. And the surprise came when the check uh, was presented to the PTA at the time, and they presented us a check for $13,000. And what I realized at that moment, uh, one, it made me angry enough to quit my job and go figure this out. Uh, but what I realized in that moment was the real winner in all of this was the company. They took 60% of the money that, um, that we had raised. And I thought about that and I thought for a second, if I had told a donor that I was giving away 60% of their money to a company and not to the track, I probably would not have been able to raise a single dollar if I had tried, if I had been transparent with them about where that money was actually going. And so, you know, I think there has been a shift in the culture for parents, a uh, shift in culture for schools around transparency, um, away from product fundraising, away from so many things. But I would love to hear from both you and Lena. You know, what does that look like? How has that changed? You want me to start? Or you okay. Uh, well, I think. I think from our perspective, um, we want to make it easier for parents to engage um, and give. And we also want to help schools be more strategic about their fundraising plans and strategies. So um, in our office, we'll go out and help schools think through what their goals are, what their vision is for what they're trying to accomplish, and then align the fundraising strategy with that. So it may be that what they want to do is best supported by a grant. And we have some grant programs through our Austin Ed Fund. We have um, knowledge of a lot of other school grant programs. So we may say, you know, this is best served through a grant proposal. Let us help you, support you in writing that. Uh, many times crowdfunding is a great strategy for it. And, um, and we work with Gary and his team to support our campuses in crowdfunding strategies um, to support their um, efforts. You know, sometimes it's going down to a local business and asking them to sponsor an event. But um, a lot of times some of these fundraising efforts traditionally have been driven by vendors approaching the school. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but there's, um, there's not necessarily a vetting process that's standard for schools to look at what is the percent return that you're getting in exchange for that fundraiser? So, um, so in our office, we we many of our schools do merchandise sales, and that's okay. We just we just help schools look strategically at that and decide for themselves if that is a good path forward for them. We don't centrally get involved with merchandise sales um, because we find other strategies more effective and that return more um, of the proceeds to our campuses. Awesome. Um, the other thing I'll say to all those parents out there, um, you want nothing more sometimes than to just get some points with your kids. And uh, I think you know schools sometimes make that can make that difficult. So online is a place where parents can participate regardless if they have to work um, or, or not during the, the time of the fundraiser. I, I remember looking at some of the opportunities that were to go support my son and they were Tuesday at two o'clock. Um, and there was no way, I was a single dad at the time, there was no way I was gonna make that, that fundraiser. But if there was an opportunity to give online, I would have participated. And I feel like sometimes the, the school probably wrote me off in terms of my wanting to participate, and it really wasn't a, a lack of wanting. It was just no facility, no way for me to actually do that that was you know, uh, able to fit into my life, which uh, online would have, would have done that for me. So as you're thinking about this, I don't know how many educators we have or people from districts, but that is a growing component of this for, for parents. Um, so Lena, I'm actually going to bring you in on this. This is a, this is a growing area. Um, if we can put that slide back up real quick. Uh, this is a growing area. Crowdfunding has exploded onto the scene. Um, 10 years ago, maybe you had one or two teachers that had done a fundraiser uh, online. Now you have, you know, depending on your district and district size, you can have 20 to 30 percent 
of your teacher population that has an online campaign. And with that has come some unintended consequences for, for the district uh, because these fundraisers are a part of that district. And, and so um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that and I think there's, there's some regulatory things, but there's also, um, Michelle, I like you, the way you put this, ways that we can safeguard everybody, including, including teachers. Um, but these are some of the issues that are at play and I'd love to just chat about some of those for a second and uh, if we can bring uh, Lena back in. Um, this is where Chandler really, really started down this path. Sure. So we had a lot of issues when we actually looked into this. Um, we found really quickly that teachers were posting things that might not be um, in line with our district strategic plan or our mission or our vision, or they had a great intent, but unfortunately they were violating something, a process, a procedure, even maybe a policy within our school district. We had teachers who were posting about raising money for their own students. Some of those students could be a special ed student where we're supposed to provide that through an IEP. We could have sometimes teachers were um, actually posting money for their classroom and the money was going back through their own bank account um, for a project or something that they were doing at their school. But we found that coaches were raising money for their team and it wasn't going through the proper method. Um, but our name, when you look at all these, these fundraisers, it would be our name on there, Chandler Unified School District, and then the support, the classroom, the child, the activity. And so as we started to look into this, we found that we needed a system to regulate that. Not only did we want to make sure we were following our processes and our procedures, but we also wanted to make sure we were politically okay. Sometimes we would have in Arizona what's a bond or an override, something our voters were approving. In other states, those are called levies. And sometimes the message that's out there is, hey, we're asking for money, but then we're posting for money. So we want to be really careful with what our message is related to crowdfunding, and we want to make sure that it all aligns at the same time. But not only do we need to make sure that we're following processes and procedures, we also politically need to make sure that what was posted out there didn't hurt or damage our district or our schools. It's super important to look through all that. If anything, I always tell schools, be careful. Know what you have out there. Principals know what's out there on social media. Know if you're following those processes and procedures, and if not, start to look at it. Every school district has a fundraiser procedure, but not very many school districts have crowdfunding procedures specifically. So you want to be careful with that. You want to start to dive in. So what do you have in place and how can you align them for your district so, so that you can raise money for your uh, for your school in a different avenue, but you know you're protected. We know that our parents are pretty sophisticated related to online apps, online funding systems, mechanisms and everything we do anymore they pay through an app or online they look up something via the computer and so at this point our parents are savvy they want more of a crowdfunding platform so you need to make sure you've got processes and procedures in place that meet those new needs Lena um, Michelle I know that uh, teacher autonomy in Austin is just embedded in the culture and that is really, like you said, where innovation happens. So how do you how do you manage that that culture of teacher uh, uh, autonomy with uh, a climate of you know there are some risks? And I, I really liked your perspective on on this. Um, well, I think that uh, what we tried to do in Austin is just sort of embrace reality. So, um, as Lana said, like people want to give online, they expect to give online, they expect to have an easy experience. Um, and we frankly didn't have that. Um, so it was kind of the wild, wild west. Um, and uh, and I think it, it what we tried to do is put a set of guidelines in place, which we did, um, and then set up a system that we endorsed and supported and rolled out district wide, um, which is Living Tree. So that system, is integrated with uh, principal approval, for example. So a teacher posts a campaign, it needs to be approved by the principal. The, on the back side, the finances are linked with our bookkeeping system. Um, and then it, it all loads into our, our donor database, uh, which is Salesforce. We have tax receipts that are automatically generated for our donors. Um, 
then we're able to track and report all that and then provide stewardship for our people who are contributing. So um, I think we've been able to put some structure and guidelines in place that help encourage teachers to do more of this and foster that innovation, but within a process that um, it provides them some structure and also provides them cover. I mean, we I think we we have campaigns, we have had campaigns that are going directly to teacher individual bank accounts. And I think, um, you know, I think that puts a lot of burden and responsibility on a teacher um, when that's not necessary. So I think having a system that's aligned with the district um, procedures and protocols. And, you know, when we started down the road, I think there were a couple of voices in the district that just were like, no, 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 no crowdfunding. We can't do this at all. And um, we had we, we were very strong and kind of coming back and saying like this is reality and we're missing the boat if we can't create our systems and process to support and even encourage this to happen in our district awesome thank you um so we're gonna we're gonna get to the fun part at least that's that's all the compliance and regulatory stuff and some of the issues which you know if you get anything out of this talk i you know i hope you know, no matter where you're at on the spectrum that awareness, you gotta be aware, right? So start there, find out what's out there in the district's name, what's, find out what's out there in your school's name. Um, but when this starts working, um, and Austin has done an amazing job of this, and, and Chandler right behind them, uh, you know, some really cool stuff happens. At the end of the day, uh, this goes to support kids uh, when, you do, when you do it right. So Michelle, what did, this, what did this look like for you guys as you have gone through this process? And then what are some of the effects that it's had on your community? Right. Well, um, I think one of the things that was really important to us is to have a platform that was um, accessible by all of our campuses. So we have about 130 campuses, 80,000 students, 11,000 employees. And um, the, the history was that you had certain schools that were really adept at fundraising and development and had online tools and had all kinds of, um, you know, almost professional fundraising <laughs> operations going on at those campuses. And then you had a whole lot of other campuses that didn't have those resources and have access. So we wanted a platform that was available to every single one of our campuses. And when we set it up, we set it up and still exists to this day. Every single one of our campuses has a fundraising page. Um, that just exists and set up and campuses can use it um, as they want to receive donations. And then from there, campuses can really take it and grow it. And this is an example. So this is, um, this is Austin High School. Um, go Maroons, if anyone's here from Austin High School. Um, and these are a couple of examples of, camp, of campaigns, um, individual classroom campaigns, a memorial scholarship campaign that that campus did, and then a back the track campaign that is about renovating the track um, at Austin High School. So you can see just a variety of different projects um, that have supported that campus that are responding to the, the needs of that campus. And we have several examples of that. And then I, are you gonna go to the next? I'm okay. gonna, yeah. We'll bring uh, Lena in. Uh, Lena, you know, I know you guys have also, you know, uh, Austin did this about three and a half years ago. Um, Chandler's at the front end of this process. What what did that look like for you guys? And then let's let's talk about those specific campaigns. And Gary, can you repeat that question one more time, please? Sure. So as you went through this process, it, the first part was awareness, um, and then as you started to implement and get the right things in place, what did that what did that start to do for Chandler and the community? So. I'm going to, I apologize, I'm going to turn down the speaker, so hopefully it's a little bit more clear. So we um, we started looking at our process a, few, a couple of years ago. It's, it's been about a year and a half. And um, we found really quick, quickly that we had a board policy on fundraising, but we didn't really, really have any mechanisms on crowdfunding. And so the very first thing we had to do was we had to look at our policies to make sure that we had board policy to back what we were doing. Then the second thing that we started looking at was what were our procedures? What were our internal procedures and what did we allow? Um, at that point, we created some of our own guidance on that. And then we started to look at what tools. So a lot of people were using different tools. They were using SnapRaise, they were using FundMe, they were using other tools, um, DonorsChoose. We had a lot of different procedures in place. 
And we had to come, we had to start figuring out what were those processes and procedures, and then how to educate everybody on it. So we started to educate all of our principals. We had them go out and look. We have 45 different schools. We have 46,000 students. So we had everybody kind of take a look at what was out there, and we started to put in some practices in place that could help guide our principals in our school. And then we actually did an RFP once we decided the tool that we wanted to use, what kind of tool. We, needed, we knew we needed a platform of some form to help us with guidance, with the approval process, with accounting for the dollars that came back in. So we started down that path of reviewing and looking at different products out there across the nation that would meet our needs here in Chandler. And then once we got through that, we had to actually train all of our staff on that. We had to train our schools, but we also had to train our boosters and our PTO because a ton of the money gets funneled to that avenue too. So it wasn't just our schools, but it was also our 200 boosters and uh, PTOs at that point. So it all begins with looking at your policy, then at your procedures, then at what are your current practices that are taking place and how can we define what those practices are and write rules around them and then educate and train everybody on them. But also, it's not just pushing it down their throat. Why are there not? You have to explain why it safeguards them and protects it. It also helps us make sure we're in line with what we call the uniform system of financial records. So we're matching all of our guidance. We also got attorney advice, and we also went to our auditor general and said, "Hey, can you look at this because we believe there's going to be a lot of fraud in the future. How can you help us protect against this?" So we try to get a lot of different people involved make sure that we were taking the right steps and that since we're a leader in our state, we wanted to make sure we are doing things right to help other school districts in the future too. A lot of different steps starting from policies to procedures to then training and implementation. Now, we're not perfect. We have a lot of room to grow and we're going to continue to get better, but we need, we need to take the first step by just looking into that process to begin with. Otherwise, it's just hard. It kind of snowballs on you. So you want to make sure you get going with it, even if it's baby steps and you're only at the very beginning. Just know that you need to start to implement something because it's, it, this area is going to grow and grow. It's the new mechanism uh, for people to raise money. Um, if parents love it, they don't want the old forms of fundraising. I have four kids of my own and I hate going door to door to sell things. There are still a lot of fundraising mechanisms in that arena, but a lot of people are utilizing this to make their money. You do, and I, I, I don't know if you can hear it, but you're competing against a party that has already started. <laughs> so sorry uh, about that. So we'll just go quickly. We've got a couple minutes left. I want to talk about just two campaigns that Austin has done that I think is just absolutely awesome. And just the power of this over time as you guys have grown your program, I think has been incredible. Right. Um, so in addition to... Um, putting this out and training um, campuses and encouraging them to use this platform and use their networks to, to reach out. We have also had some campaigns around district initiatives and one of them was um, our school lunch balances. So um, that's a story it has been in the national media. You've probably heard a lot about it. Um, school kids whose lunch accounts um, are unpaid. Um, being stigmatized, et cetera. We have, di we have good practices around that in Austin ISD, but we saw an opportunity to offset the losses of, of students who are unable to pay their lunch balances by doing a crowdfunding campaign. We've done this campaign two or three times now, and it gets picked up by the media almost instantly, and, um, and we raise typically 10 to 20K um, almost overnight because our community just comes forward um, to support kids um, and make sure that they're able to have a healthy lunch at school and their their lunch balances are current. So that it's been we've had a couple of instances like these where we've been able to sort of promote these um, district initiatives centrally that support kids across the district that have really um, really resonated with our community. And the next one I think um, that Gary will show is um, or did you want to talk about the well, I'll, I'll talk briefly here. You know, I think the power of crowdfunding is illustrated in those two donors that you have there. So you have an anonymous donor for $5 and you have an anonymous donor for $1,000. And what I love about that contrast is that it doesn't matter how big your bank account is, or how many resources you have, or, you know, how many zeros uh, are behind your last name. Um, you've got a place online. And when... Uh, Austin ISD launched this campaign, 
we had a lot of folks that resonated with being hungry themselves in school. And they said, I don't care if I have $5 to give, I'm going to give that um, and I'm going to help one kid not go hungry. And I think that is the power of an online platform. And you know, you, you have room for everybody at the table. Right. Um, and so what this has allowed us to do too, so our next, the next campaign that Gary will show is this Project Help campaign, which is Austin ISD's program that serves homeless students. And we did this campaign um, just this last holiday season and, um, and raised almost $10,000 with one email blast. And again, what this has allowed us to do, you saw the meal um, campaign and other campaigns, we now have a donor database and a donor pipeline of people that we know care about kids in our community, want our schools to be successful. And so we use those lists then when we have a project help campaign, we're able to reach back out to that same group of people. And we've seen many, many repeat donors. They may be $5 donors. We have many that have donated $1,000 or above online multiple times that now we're able to cultivate and kind of provide some stewardship, educate them more about what's going on in AISD and thank them for giving. So it's been a, it's been an amazing opportunity to do campaigns like this too and our project help coordinator is like beyond grateful she was able to actually keep several families housed over the holidays because of this campaign and we were able to get those funds to her program in enough time to do that so um, just a couple of great examples of how this platform has been able to work for us and crowd we've kind of really embraced crowdfunding Awesome. And when I got that email, because I got the email, I was like, this is this was the dream. I got it on my phone. I clicked the button. I gave and I was done in three minutes. So thank you, um, Gary. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're just going to if you guys have, want more information on this, um, we have resources from both Austin ISD and Chandler available. Um, so we've got a QR code up there. If you just are old school and want to write this down, uh, it's learn.livingtree.com. Give together. It has the policies and procedures that Chandler's put in place. Um, to govern their crowdfunding um, in the district, and, and they're always a great resource. Obviously, Michelle is here, uh, Lana, and Chandler. So thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time uh, with us today. Thanks again. Thank you.